and thank you for uh, having me here to share my experiences around the ambitious title, Art of Innovation. Uh, for me, it has been a journey with many stops and linkages to the term of innovation in different ways. My journey started in Norway where my name is Anbjörg. Anbjörg is not an easy name to have uh, other than in Norway. But uh, so uh, I will continue to be Anna here tonight because after all, I'm going mostly to talk about my time here in the United States as a designer for the brands, brands as uh, Lorraine mentioned, uh, Pyrex, Corningware, and mostly about Corel worldwide. My story, as I said, started in a, in a little village where the North Sea uh, was my closest neighbor. As a young girl, I used to sit looking at the horizon and see the ocean and dreaming about how it would be like on the other side of the world. I was dreaming about America, a play place I knew my grandfather once lived in his youth and others, uh, relatives uh, that are still living there today. I have actually found out on this trip that I have some living even here around Decora. Uh, for me, uh, like you see the, the, the little girl there, <laughs> um, I probably knew even around when I was seven that I was going to be an artist or so uh, kind uh, when I grew up. And maybe I would also go over to America one day. Before I dive into my time as a designer here in the United States, I will take a moment to honor some of the women in my life that unknowingly maybe have been my early influences and giving me inspiration to do this journey. My mother, who was the first to give me oil and brushes instead of crayons, and allowed me to paint on all kinds of surfaces. Then it was grandmother Anna who th uh, taught me how to find beauty in every thread and uh, gave me her spinning wheel and my name. And then we have grandmother Petrina, who taught me to set a table and that butter, yes, butter, should be presented with pride. It was her brother, Frederick, that immigrated to America and brought his young family over uh, here to Wisconsin. And many of his kids and grandkids still lives around here and have been students at Lutheran College. Some of them I am meeting, like I said uh, before, for the first time on this visit. The letters between my grandma and her brother's wife, Christina, are also referred to Alita Kozak's book, Christina, Finding Home. Then we have Hannah Riggen. She was a world-known weaver who always walked up our street on the first day of spring and greeted us kids. She was uh, living in Trondheim and other places and was originally Swedish, but she had a little farm uh, where I, close to where I lived. And this was sort of the symbol of spring, because that day when Hannah Riggen came up the street, we could take off our winter booths and put on our spring shoes. It was a big day. I never forgot her. She was such a lovely person. And 
what I later learned that she wrote her stories into striking political topics. And, to, and this summer, uh, Hannah Regan Triennial Anti Monument is now showing in Trondheim and several other places this summer. And it's worth looking her up if you have a chance. And then my older sister, Ragnil, who was the first to take me to a Picasso exhibition. Never forget it. I was probably a, a teenager at that time. And just to see how an artist could be so uh, painting so uh, different from the time he began to the way he ended. So it's a, truly a journey. And then is Kari Dudal, my college class and roommate at the Bergen Academy of Arts and Crafts. Because we could do it all. That was what we felt. And in one way, we did. Here she is with one of her very large tapestries she is so known for today. What other these women had in common was the passion for what they were doing, the art and their crafts. To the students, I used to say always when I talk with them, look around you. And I'm pretty sure that someone here in this room will have a major influence on your future. Hold on to it, hold tight. And you might not see it today, but you will tomorrow. Uh, for me, um, I ended up going a lot to schools, many, many different schools. We have a very different school system than, than uh, over here. Um, but um, I, all of them were, in fact, about textiles. And I ended up with a four year at the Bergen Academy of Arts and Crafts. Um, which is of course a very long time ago now. But before the pandemic, I visited the old stamping grounds before they moved into their new fabulous facilities. This old building had so much soul and energy. Seeing this little note up there, you see that? Um, uh, it was written, at the time I was on uh, in the school, we went to, to, uh, to the school as a student and, and uh, it, uh, it said, you know, when you rest, you rust. And this note still was written there um, nearly 40 years later. And it was amazing to see because it was so true. We never rested. We worked day and night, a night at that, that school. And uh, because we also knew where the key was under that stone, and nobody uh, should really know, but it was there. And it was a creative bubble, not only academically, but politically, and also per personally as well. We were very engaged uh, to what was going uh, to happen with us in the future. We organized, we uh, obtained junior membership in, in the art organizations, and we have made seminars about how to build studios. We had different actions and we got a lot of things through. Uh, it was a very, very engaging uh, uh, period. And then came the exhibition, which was called Some Live or translated to common life or living together. And, and still as an art student, I was invited to participate in this collaboration between various artists and medical students and scientists to solve a medical 
and social problem, how to broaden uh, the knowledge about our sexual health and identity and among the general population. And this was a problem, and it's probably always a problem in a way, but we used art to communicate. And this became a huge exhibition, not only with, with words, it was artwork, it was sculptures, it was dance, it was um, music. Uh, and we filled the biggest uh, museums with this topic. Of course, it was a very, very controversial uh, thing. And it, in one sense, it was also scandalous, um, but it was extremely successful. It reached the people through all the media and uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, is, and also I I traveled, I um, got to travel uh, around the country with this uh, exhibition and uh, working and motivating local artists to be, participate in it. And, you know, when an exhibition in a small country like, like Norway ended up having 70,000 visitors being on the front page news every day and we have to say that this was art that mattered. It engaged, and for some, this was maybe a little bit dangerous, but uh, um, part of this ex exhibition is still going on today. And uh, the documented history is in a permanent place in the museum. And according to the former Dean of Yale School of Art here in the States, Marta Kusma, uh, she said also, this also became art history. The art historian calls it very innovative. So maybe we also, uh, it also is an innovation. It could be the way it was put together and uh, communicated. So that was a big thing for me. And uh, it, it really uh, opened my eyes to think big uh, for anything I did in the future. Um, and then the school was over. Now it was time to start up with, with the studio, which we had studied and how to do and so on. And uh, we needed a store and it made one ourselves. We called it up and trap, that, that they were up one step and was created. And we had savvy craft peoples with us too, not only students straight out from the school, uh, but this was not easy. Uh, to 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 make it go. So I decided to, um, to do some new things and, and new opportunities maybe. And that was going to work on an oil plat platform. Um, oil was also a hot political subject and I wanted to know more. I wanted to see for myself and it was a way to get an income really fast. I went out to work on the, the platform uh, in the North Sea for two weeks at a time, and then I had three weeks off. That was perfect for, for doing also studio work and, and having the, the, the um, uh, store. Um, but also as I worked on there, uh, new opportunities rises. The idea of a first art gal gallery ever on an oil platform. And um, that happened. I, not when I was there, but later on, I, I started talking with the management and got the seed started. And the organizations in Bergen took it over and, and it was a success. But then came March 1980 the collapse of the platform Alexander Challon. I was supposed to go out the next day. 
Um, that night, 110 people died. And that was the end for me. I never went out um, on, on the platform. I needed to think other ways of doing, uh, yeah, and finding a living uh, on it. And suddenly, new opportunity again. And that, this time, it was Africa. Um, it was the Norwegian Development uh, Aid Organization, NORA, that asked me to work for the Kenya's Ministry of Women and Social Services to establish small scale industries in textiles using local raw materials. And that was how we founded the women's group um, in creating a craft organization for them. Um, this was very, very fascinating work and not, not easy either. I ended up being there for, for four years supporting them. And, and it is also said that it was the first company, like a group that uh, to be owned entirely by women. And today the group is supported by its own revenue stream and with some help from local companies and nonprofits, but they own the buildings, they own the, the equipment and they run it by themselves. I'm really proud of that. And uh, today there are about 20 members on owners of this and um, they are mostly single women that they are the sole breadwinners for the families. And what is the charming thing when I started to, to look uh, what was happening, I found the same women working there, most, most of them working there today as they did uh, when I was there in the early 80s. <laughs> So that's, but so then from Africa to where should I go back to Norway? Maybe doing te textiles in Japan was all those questions. Dealing with another language again, maybe that's not what I really wanted. Swahili and English was maybe enough for me for that time. So, uh, this was now in the mid eighties and you know, New York was so hot and Paris was not. And so there I went to FIT, Fashion Institute of New York to study textiles and surface design again <laughs> and continuing that. But that was more to get into the group of what was happening now uh, around us. So that was two more years of school. So uh, it ended up to be a total of nine. Uh, it was uh, fantastic. Now it was my turn to inhale new knowledge. And I did extremely well because it was so different to be back in school at an uh, older age then when you started out, uh, you could really concentrate and focus. So after that, so then again, the question came up, should I go back to Norway? Oh, not yet. So let me see if I could get work here at least for another year. And I, uh, had a great place to live, and I love New York City. Um, but also the question was, how could I stand out? Where should I look for work? And why should companies want me? All those things uh, became sort of a focus and, and trying to figure things out. Um, but I did get a job uh, on Fifth Avenue. That was not bad. Um, doing upholstery for the uh, automotive makers. 
and maybe not so fun in, in a sense, but it was on Fifth Avenue. So I, I was very interested in, in that. Um, but then someone from FIT suddenly came and said, oh, we have somebody who is asking for, for you. Uh, 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 it is a, a huge company and it's Corning. And they said, Corning Glassworks. And I said, I, I don't do glass. But they said, check it out. Just check it. Call them. Talk with them. And I did. Now I was going to fly up to uh, Corning, New York. Um, my, but my portfolio, it was extremely big. Textile portfolios, you can hide behind. You, it is, you can hardly get it into a, a taxi and definitely not into an airplane. So now I had to say, what am I doing? I have to show my portfolio. And then again, you turn around and said, okay, we have to find a solution to this. And then suddenly said, I had seen a photocopy machine demonstrated once that at that time could uh, color correct. It could print on many different types of papers and it could reduce. It was magic at this time of the year. Can you believe it now? That is what we all do. But anyway, so I decided to make the smallest portfolio in the world, a textile portfolio. And I made just small books or reduced all my designs and put them into a little briefcase that I could carry in to the airplane without leaving it or shipping it. So there it was. And I think that was a way for me to, to, to get to uh, show what I was doing in, and not being worried for losing my art. So there, like I said, there we went on the plane to Corning, upstate New York, for the uh, interviews with the executives at the Glassworks. And to go there and to, suddenly I was told this was one of the world's largest glass companies in America and also maybe in the world. And the company that had made the first light bulb uh, and now had just invented optical fibers and was uh, revolutionizing the way we were going to communicate in the future. Why are they interested in me? That was now to be discovered. Uh, with my, the first site when I flew over there, it was a little bit uh, similar to some of the landscape in, in uh, Norway, hilly, um, lakes, beautiful. And there was a little city. Um, and I loved it with the first sight. It was quaint, um, about 10,000 people maybe, surrounded by the, those beautiful finger lakes and that is lined with wineries and many farms to, to table restaurants around. And the main street was flourishing with small galleries and shops and hosting many different festivals I learned also and uh, that was what Corning is known for glass of all kinds and like I said it was also the home for the fortune 500 company Corning Glass Glassworks and now that is called Corning Incorporated this this but little me the girl who had been studying textiles for so many years how could I end up with the world's leading innovator? Oh, sorry, I maybe I did. Yeah, back to this. <laughs> okay. Um, 
how how could I? Uh, okay, a pause. My little me, the girl who had been studying textiles for so many years, how could I end up with the world's leading innovator in material science? With all this life's changing innovations in glass and ceramic science, optical physics, me from the little windy place called Erlana. Um, I was, uh, I didn't know how, how this, but the immediately when I walked into the buildings, I felt home. This was going to be a place I would love to, to share my knowledge, whatever it was, I would like to be there. And today, Corning Incorporated is nearly a nine billion company with over 50,000 employees worldwide. And I'm really, really proud that I was able to join them for some years before things changed with our brands. Mm -hmm. And I got the job as a senior designer to be responsible for the trends of sur and surface treatments, colors and decor for Corral Corningware and Pyrex. But when I was introduced um, to the organization, uh, it was some uh, of the executive uh, uh, members uh, introduced me uh, about uh, what was they reflecting over, can you imagine? Or what do you think? Do you think it was my little portfolio? Do you think it was my art education? No. The one thing that he introduced me was the designers who had been uh, working on an oil platform in the North Sea. That was how I got introduced on it. So you never know. You know what you have in your pockets. What is uh, the uh, most uh, uh, memorable about you might not be what you you think yourself. We I probably would have not even have mentioned it in a sense, but um, that was how it was. So. Over the years, since I started uh, in 1987 um, under the name Corning Glassworks, um, dramatic changes happened in 1998 when Corning divested consumer product divisions that um, those brands, Corningware and Corel and all, it was a lot of brands that consumer products uh, brands belong to. Uh, they, they got sold uh, to Borden Foods and they merged three other, uh, three companies together. Uh, the other companies were General Housewares uh, and Echo, and that was Kitchenware and Metal Bakeware. And um, General Housewares was mostly about uh, OXO and they had, tools and gadgets and so on. And uh, we, uh, or th that company was then under the umbrella of World Kitchen. That became our new name, the new company and name. And the headquarters uh, moved from Corning to Rosemont, Illinois. And by the time I left the company, uh, it was also up for sale again, and um, uh, another um, uh, investments uh, company bought it, and it emerged the brands uh, in 2019 with instant brands that do instant pots and so on. I don't know much about that, but uh, things are changing always to what what is needed and is the story <laughs> yeah goes on you know 
And uh, that is where the brands are today. But uh, let us start a little bit of, of the history uh, from uh, uh, what they are about and often new innovations for all this brand happened through lucky accidents is what we call it. For example, on the Pyrex, that begins with uh, an industrial heat resistant glass that was used for the railway uh, lanterns. And uh, they needed to, to get an improved glass so uh, it could withstand the different temp temperature from winter to summer and, and, uh, and so on. And uh, again, it was the wife of one of the scientists who was working on it. She had baked a pie uh, with a glass dish, dish in an oven that broke. Uh, and she said, maybe some of the new improved glasses would work as, a, as a, something she could uh, bake in. And she took, uh, the husband took some glass home and uh, there were more like a lantern dishes of the lantern glass. And uh, she tried it out in a different ways and she was really, really happy. And um, that was also how the, the Pyrex uh, baking dishes started up by really a uh, broken dish in the oven and using some of the other new glass types uh, that proved to be fantastic. And actually, uh, the scientist behind that, he was uh, educated. He came from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and, and that was, um, now I see. Yes, okay, I suddenly I've mixed up some, some uh, names in my head here, but that was Jesse Littleton uh, was his name. And that name you, you hear often over and over in, in the history of, of consumer products for, for Corning. And also the same uh, is uh, for other brands, uh, it was um, uh, another scientist, Donald Sturkey, who he was working on a specific photo form glass that was used for TV. And uh, the furnace, uh, uh, that uh, thermometer uh, in the furnace had broken one day. So he, when he opened up the door, he expected to see a puddle of melted glass. Instead, it was white and firm. He took the tongue out and it slipped and it fell. And he thought it would break, but it didn't. And that was how Corningware was born. And, uh, and so it is a, it's, it's really by uh, some accidents things can happen, but you have to understand what, what is happening, how it can be used uh, when, when, when those uh, happen, yeah. And uh, also when you come to Corel, uh, uh, it was originally a glass meant to be for a TV glass. And we will look into a little bit later here, I think, uh, of how all that happened. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I was able to influence these iconic American brands to keep them current. Uh, to do so, uh, I and my team had to play a strong liaison with the innovation group, the marketing, 
manufacturing and sales, and not to forget the network of all the designers around the globe that we had access to, and they helped us to flawlessly execute programs. Um, most of the times, 40 to 50 new patterns a year, and sometimes we could have up to 100. And that is a lot to, to go through. And um, it also costs a lot of money if you do a mistake. <laughs> so uh, uh, to do um, with the limitations in the, in the factory, which you, we will see a little bit later, uh, uh, it was really important that, that we did it the, the right, the, the first th uh, time. And also, uh, when it comes to shapes, I, they didn't happen that frequently, mainly because it very quickly cost a million dollars for one little bowl to develop. And when you needed to have that all the range, it be, became very capital um, uh, heavy uh, to, to get funding to, to do those. So we had to use the, the shapes more maybe than other um, companies did. And that was uh, uh, maybe some something we designers wish we could have a little bit more flexibility uh, than we had. Mm -hmm. So uh, on my team, I had um, seven people uh, in the, especially in maybe in around the, the last 15 years of when I was there. And uh, they were very, very tight knit team. Uh, it, it, we were seven, yeah, I said that. And it was from, we had them. Uh, project managers, we had designers, we had a studio manager, and also we were uh, responsible for exhibitions, uh, trade shows, uh, how we, we set them up and, and manage those. So it was a lot of things we, we um, were involved in, not just doing the, the designs itself, but also how to take them to the sales force, how to show them, and, and also a lot of photography we did. So let us go back to the 60s and see what was going on in the home and the kitchen at that time, because it was some new innovations that, that happened. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the new trends was very casual and fun and uh, brighter colors and then you were eating in front of the TV or out at the pool if you had that or doing a picnic. Carefree products were very important. Anything that could make things easier and faster was the game. And the microwave oven was also invented at that time. And the first one was called Ra the Range by, by Amada. And that is also a side note. <laughs> the development of that was also a lucky accident. It was an inventor who was working on some uh, waves, experiments, and so on. Uh, suddenly, um, felt that like his chocolate in his pocket was melted. And when he looked, it was not only melted, it was cooked. And then he started to experiment and, and did popcorn and other easy things, and it came out perfect. And the first oven uh, was huge, and it also ended up to be expensive. Expensive, but soon it became it got into the kitchens, and I think now we were nearly around the seventies, uh, early seventies, yes. And uh, at that time, the melamine was the popular dinnerware, 
It was lightweight. It was strong. It was fun with a, a lot of great colors and decor. However, it was a problem there because melamine turns poisonous and decomposes in the microwave oven. So here suddenly people couldn't use their dishes into this fabulous new invention. So there was a new consumer need, strong, light, but attractive and microwaveable, safe dish um, for reheating. And this became then an opportunity for Corning. And the answer was that the, we are using the TV screen glass that became the new material vitrell. So this was this, the start of Corel. And in 1970, it was introduced pristine white. She shined. Media adored her and had fun showing off the plates being thrown uh, across the floor and even off rooftops. This made uh, watchers scream and became the talk of the town wherever you were. This made it quickly clear that this dinner had to be made for the millions worldwide. And this is where it's made. Corning, New York, still is. And the name of the factory, it's got its name, Presver. And it's very descriptive name of the plant, um, even before it made it to be become uh, 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 Corel. But the manufacturing there has all uh, along been about pressing things. And the pressing glass. Uh, so they had also these big, big tanks. And that is what Corel is made of, pressed glass. I remember the first time when I walked into the factory and to the manufacturing floor, I felt like I was a, like a tiny little mouse uh, up against the huge elephant. And the proportion were even bigger, I think, than that. Uh, and it was very, very hot. 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit is the melting point of the, uh, it is like earth and fire because it is sand and, and uh, heat that melt this into a glass. Also, what they are putting into the tank is a colored, that is the things we are not using um, of the glass goes back in and getting melted. And it's also very important for the pro process. Um, so uh, it is actually all about the layers. It is two different glass types. What we call, you see up in the, in the corner here, uh, it is um, uh, three layers of gla uh, glass, but two different glass types. And one is the core glass, and that is white, or in some cases, we also make a tint a version of it. Uh, and then it is a skin glass on the top and on the bo bottom that is totally clear and very, very thin. And these are sort of laminated uh, to, uh, together. And, uh, and when they are fused sort of together also with the heat and the pressure, it becomes uh, very, very strong. And um, during this uh, process, and it is, First, you, you put them together and then you 
uh, create a stress uh, between the layers that holds them to, to gather and uh, keeps sort of attention. And then um, it becomes very impact resistant. But we also have to, uh, yeah, no, actually here, it is another picture, uh, which is really <laughs> nice to see. Um, the, you see the roller on the side? It is actually, when I saw it the first time, I thought, oh, wow, this looks like a sheet of textile, a roll of textiles that comes through and uh, getting formed and it is lays over the mold that it has a huge, huge wheel. And then it uh, gets sucked in uh, to the molds. And then it's sort of a cookie cutter that um, gets the, the items out of that sheet of now suddenly it is, is, a, is hard, but in the beginning it was soft, and now it, in a just very short time it becomes hard. And uh, now we have also to fuse the edges, and that is something we do with the uh, fire polishing, which we are going to see here. You see there, there on, on the left, that is also how we are fusing the edges together so, so it that becomes really strong. Um, we also have a lot of decorations. Oh yeah, maybe I should also, bef before we go to the decorations, uh, you know, we also get them into a layer and uh, Therefore, um, it uh, temper the, the glass, and but all this goes really fast. Um, you know, the, the layers, you, I think you, you just do some five, five minutes uh, time before it's all done. So, uh, and also when it comes to decoration, that is also uh, fused, uh, core glass, oh no, a glass fritz that is put into the inks that get printed onto the dishes directly on. And we have a lot of very specific machines that can do certain things. Uh, uh, and it is, uh, some are very fast, other is a little bit slower and, uh, and can do more details. Um, but it is fascinating, uh, all these things, and that is, you know, th that the decoration doesn't come off when it comes to the coral. It is because it is actually melted into the core, uh, to the surface glass uh, on, on there. So sometimes, though, because we are dependent on what the machines can, can make, it is a lot of limitations on what we can do. And that makes it also really, really challenging, uh, but fun too. And that's uh, also like in a short way, how the Corel glass is made. You know, Corel is su superior. It is nothing out there that can meet the same break and chip uh, resistant. That is so lightweight, it's easy to handle. It is oven safe, it is microwave safe, it's dishwasher, and it's also very versatile. And think about all the dishes you can put in one stack, you know, uh, compared to others that is big, this one can be very, very few. And, um, for a designer, it is very rare uh, to work with a material that nobody else can do. It's nowhere else in the world this is getting made than in Corning, New York. And, um, and, and that is also 
why we need a lot of experts. It's not just to come in and say, oh, we will design for this. You have to know the specifics uh, and details. And sometimes it takes years before you can understand what those are and being fluent in, in it. So far, we have talked mostly about the material and a bit about the shape development. But the big part for Corel is the development of all the different patterns. Um, here you can see an example of how a design is developed and changed according to the printing processes that are available. Uh, one additional design can have many different execution and color options. And it's all uh, depends also on what price point you want to, to hit. Uh, the original design to the left was made by Julia Popels, um, a um, designer from the UK, and um, that's her rendering. However, when it comes to in our, our hands, we have to adapt it to the processes we we can do. And uh, uh, to the right, there is actually also um, a design that is made into an embossed dinner. And that in itself is very, very uh, interesting. Um, uh, this method actually has been uh, awarded uh, uh, a design patent. Actually, we have several patents like uh, embossing that has a, a design patent. And we are sharing that between the original designer, me as a design director, and also the, the uh, engineering uh, um, uh, guy uh, uh, who, who was uh, in charge of making the etching on the rollers to be accurate. So, because it's a, it's a really strange thing when you are designing something you know is going to be stretched and you have to compensate for that. Think about that the ball when you're oh, going, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide. So you will see, uh, you know, that sheet of, of, um, of glass coming down. You see that roller there? On that roller, we put the etching of the pattern and when it goes over to the ball for example or the plate uh, it gets sucked into the mold that will be stretched uh, so we have to constant uh, um, uh, yeah we have to get that one um, accurate on to the, the roller to make it work so it doesn't look strange when it goes gets to into a, a, a finished product so it's a lot to think about to make it right and how do we know oh and that we have got it right no <laughs> that's when we see it and also probably when we are checking with the with the consumer uh, if they like it on and and so on but it is goes through so many processes and that is what i would like to to see uh talk about now and uh, this is a very simple uh process uh it is of uh, you know you have to have a, a vision and then you have to explore then you develop, you do the, the, the design, then you start doing the models or the pre-production and before you go into the production. And also to have processes for validation and tracking how well is it doing so we can learn both from our mistakes of and also the, the what went well and maybe not so well. And in between all those steps, we have to communicate to with the gatekeepers and or the stakeholders uh, so we can 
make sure all are agreeing on every steps we are doing before we are too far into a project. Uh, for me, I always ask uh, um, in every step uh, we are doing, it is sort of my rule um, that I keep asking the simple questions what, how, where, and when uh, to make the best roadmap for each design uh, uh, program. And that is, you know, how is it going to be manufactured? Uh, what market is this going to be? Who is the co customer who is going to have it? Uh, you know, also timing. If you are going to introduce it in six months, it's a very different things you, you can do than if you are going to do it in a couple of years. And also all this uh, has to be verified by research, checking with the, the customers. For me uh, also, it is the design brief. It's uh, that is the most important document uh, to ensure that we, describe the vision of the program and describe the market, describe the, uh, the trends and the st strategy and the timing. Um, and ultimately that design brief documents the criteria by which the appropriate new product design are selected and approved for launch. The design brief should be signed by all stakeholders of the project. And if it is not, you know, you don't know if we are in agreement. And that can lead you into not doing what you say you are supposed to do. And uh, it's, it's really uh, important, I find. I've always um, seen that being the key thing for success. Uh, so, oh yes, so where do we get this inspiration from? Oh, there's so many places to go. And that is what it is lovely. Uh, we look at trends, you know, you can buy a lot of trend forecasting um, products. Um, you can get them from so many sources from movies from walking the streets and also we were very lucky we traveled a lot to different trade shows all over the world actually not only here in the states but um we also um put our thoughts together in a way that we track them for the trends over years we could see what has happened with the transfer in the back for many, many years. And then we can also see some of them, how they, are, they will uh, be in to the future. Uh, these are example for um, uh, trend boards. They have colors, they have themes, they have uh, some clue text to it. And we also look at them, how have they, how was the last year? What will they be, they be th this year? Which ones are linked? Which ones are merging? Which ones are disappearing? And um, and it is fascinating. And it is uh, some some things. Oh, you are just making it up. No, it is not made up. It is a clear vision. When you are having it in front of you, you can really see what what is happening. So, um, how do we know though uh, what the consumer really wants? And that is what we use a lot of time listening to uh, the consumer. We call it um, qualitative uh, research and it can be done in many ways. Uh, 
I, some of artists, it is in small groups. Uh, we sit behind a, a, a tinted window and observing what they are talking about and looking and reacting to. Uh, but there are also other forms than that traditional fo focus group uh, uh, thing. Uh, there are more informal um, ones, which we also have called the girl, girl chats, <laughs> and the value as actually sitting among the, the cost, uh, consumers and uh, uh, talking with them. Maybe we have a little coffee and uh, some snacks to, to talk over the topic we have at hand. Sometimes they are more leading, um, trendier probably um, than the formal uh, or the more traditional fo focus groups. But we also have others like in-home visits. That is um, important to see how they have uh, organized the kitchens, what are their needs, you know, what are their opportunities, and especially when you go to other countries and working with other countries and trying to find a new product for them. Um, I was lucky to uh, go uh, visit uh, homes in both in India and in Korea and Mexico, and just seeing what uh, they are doing um, with that. And then, of course, uh, test kitchen. Um, whether you had, we had some really nice te test kitchens um, during the time uh, where we actually tested out the products, cooked, um, experimented, um, and uh, that was also very important to understand our own products, how they functioned. And I also learned uh, was to listen and ask, listen and ask. And there are incredible stories I could um, hear and learn from. But the question was always, could these ideas sell? Um, we, we, we explored them. Sometimes we went into um, prototype them, um, um, but um, to really um, figure it out, uh, focus groups is not only the an answer, we will also will know whether they will sell, and then we have other methods to do that. But before we do that, we had to make sure also that we could uh, manufacture uh, the items. So prototypes were made or mock-ups or uh, we will also see how much could we sell out of this idea or this pattern uh, and also to what price point. Um, so th all those things we prepared before um, we went into the final research and that was more quantitative, which I'm showing here. Uh, this is where we can uh, uh, meet the consumer, whether it is in person, online, or in, in groups. But this uh, research uh, tells us what the purchase intent and the preferences are among a lot of different options. In, in the pattern design, we could go into research with up to 100 designs in one setting. And uh, that was also including benchmarks, which is like our best-selling patterns, and also competitive patterns um, was included in that. And um we asked up to 500 people but maybe 300 to 500 consumers um uh, which was from strategic geographical areas uh to give us input and understand and um this was definitely a way of trying to understand 
you know, both the heartstring of the Americas um, like. And not only the Americas, but also the, the rest of the world and what works and works not. So, now you can look at these patterns, A, B, C, and D. Four patterns up here. They have been through the, the research. Uh, and guess what? Which one of these were the most successful? Um, was it the square? That was a huge introduction. Was it B? That was new looks for department stores. C, it was uh, a continuum of the contemporary designs um, on the square. And then we have this uh, simpler uh, living wear uh, design, which is only on the rim and was probably ma made in the late 80s, I think. I, I was one of the, the projects that started up it and yes if you take a guess uh you might not guess it i wouldn't guess uh, i think if i was not that involved as i am but it was number d and that pattern uh that is actually um called um, Country Cottage. Uh, it was a collaboration design, not only by me, but uh, a team. And uh, the artist behind it was uh, uh, Jenny Fry. And she was really uh, great in doing this simple, clear designs and had a little bit of a country flair which was very popular at that time. But who would even imagine that this was going to be a top seller in countries like India to Korea, to Mid -East, uh, Middle East, to USA in all corners of the country. 10 million pieces, not 10 million dollars a year at least and that is for more than 20 years uh so that is uh, more than 200 millions in its lifetime so far so my my question is so why do the consumer like it so much some uh, says it is really bad. It is the worst, you know, design. Huh. But some likes it. A lot of them likes it. Some says that is the best we have. So is it charming? Is that what it is? I could never have guessed myself. <laughs> but the story goes on and the patterns lives on too. Um, it's it's just a magical thing, and uh, thank God we have the tools to go through all this lab labyrinth, you know, and getting it to the market. It's fascinating. Also, uh, in my job, I had to address TV, a lot of PR events. And many funny things, you know, being on, on the, the runway for fashion shows and shopping channels, like in Korea, where I so suddenly speak Korean. Oh, I didn't know that, but it happens. So, and also I have been working with uh, um, giants like Joy Mangano, uh, which was also really fun. And I must say, I've had a blast doing all this. It has been fun. Uh, it has been challenging. And uh, yeah, so, but anyway, this is uh, 
worth it all when you look at this map? You know, 60 distribution in 62 countries. That's a lot. Have I been to them all? No, but I have been to many. So what am I doing these days? I am retired from the corporate, corporate life. However, I have my own company called Anna Ada New York, and I do a few projects here and there, but most days I paint, and I paint to try to understand what I hear and see. You remember the same thing? So did uh, also with uh, focus groups, you uh, ask, you listen, and then you ask. And um, it is what I hear and see uh, that is currently uh, happening around us and my, myself. Listen and ask, like I said. And these days it is difficult to understand why. That's why I'm doing it. So thank you, Tusen Tak. Be passionate about the art, the culture, and the business, and remain positive because it inspires others to be the best they can be. Thank you. Thank you.